Hello everyone, welcome to this week's Natural 9, or this episode's Natural 9, because there's two weeks between Critical Roles this time. I'm thankful for that, because I learned a very important lesson over this last weekend. Always save your notes. Because of that, another major project that I was going to be putting up got delayed. I'm still going to be working on that, so keep watch for that, I suppose. But let's get right into the nitty gritty. Oh, and as always, I'm Arthur from Natural 9, and boy howdy was this one hell of an encounter. And I don't mean that just because this is a pit fiend, I mean literally everyone could have died. Some of them very nearly did. So let's get right into the action with the Gurix encounter. Where last we left Fox Machina, they were about to get their shit fucked up by a pit fiend called Gurix and his, I'm pretty sure, friendly Aranius friend. Yeah, this is gonna be a this is gonna be a lovely night. No, it's not. No, it's not. They're all gonna fucking die. Oh god, they're gonna fucking die. A couple of notes before the episode starts. One, we do have a Pike. Pike will appear later on in the episode. But for the first part of the fight where she appears, the part of Pike will be played by Laura Bailey. Also, the debut of a new feature on Critical Role: Mood Lighting. It, Matt Mercer looks incredibly menacing behind the shade of red light. Please, please don't do that often, Matt. Please don't. Please don't make me scared of you. I'm already scared of you enough. Anyway, some great initiative rolls mean Vex go first, and she goes for it. She goes to try to grapple the pet fiend using her Bramble Shot, something that she doesn't use that often. But of course, she doesn't hit it because of a bastard natural one. This is the second natural one she's rolled in the night. The first one being an initiative roll for Pike. Maybe this wasn't such good luck. We're gonna go through some highlights of the fight. There's a lot of stuff that went on. Some of the cool stuff that happened includes Keyleth trying to trap the demons inside a water sphere. You know, all Dumbledore style. But uh, the Pit Fiend saves against it because it has advantage on all magic checks or saves against magic. Motherfucker. Uh, the Aranias gets trapped inside the watery sphere, so it's all good. Grog then does some clutch work, apparently, according to Matt later on, by grappling Gurix and attempting to do better than a certain Brock Lesnar did last week in Survivor Series. Yes, I'm still fucking mad about that. Anyway, he takes him to Suplex City. Bitch. Well, at least he tries. Unfortunately, he fails the athletic check. Gurix is still grappled, and it's apparently a really clutch moment. And then we come to one of my... Oh god, this is one of the most horrible, but also one of my favorite moments of the night. Scanlan to inspire Keela, to give her a little bit of inspiration, a little bit of that D12 goodness, decides to read from a book of limericks given to him by Talison. The book is called The Limerick, by the way, if you want to look it up on Amazon and give it to your most prudish friend. I, I will not repeat the limerick. I will not repeat the limerick. It is... It's lewd. It's incredibly lewd. It was incredibly lewd. It, to the point where Matt actually asked Marisha if she wants to take that inspiration. <laughs> Why would you buy that book for him, Dawson? Why would you do that? Anyway, the night goes on. A lot of good saves. A lot of good attacks. Gets to the point where it frustrates Matt a little bit that they're rolling so well. He straight up says, you guys are really rolling well tonight. It's frustrating me. <laughs> oh, God, Matt was going to kill him. Matt's going to TPK him. Pike shows up! She shows up, and she's still in makeup from the set of Blind Spot. Not that she does it normally, but she looked really pretty, as Laura mentions. I, I'm skipping through a lot of this because the encounter is really long, and the, I mean, there really are some small clutch moments, but it's mostly highlights. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a spectacle to behold. At one point, Scanlan tries to cutting words and attack against Vax by, in his persona of Francois Australia, collect a bill from Gurix for his two charges that he had attempted to purchase from Vox Machina. You remember the uh, the Asimir kids, which who are in the mansion, by the way. At this point, I should mention they're they're not in the fray. They're not doing anything bad. Don't sex CPS on, on Vox Machina. They are they they know what they're doing. Do they though? Do they actually know what they're doing? Ever? Not quite successful, but what's even worse at being successful is a double natural 20 on Matt's part. Matt Matt rolled the double natural 20. This was after he rolled an original natural 20 to do an attack against Vax, but Vax then used his luck feat to make him reroll, something he doesn't do that often and should be doing a lot more often. Something that Matt's actually pretty happy that he's doing now, because he's always used luck on himself. Why not use luck to screw over enemies? Unfortunately, the second roll was also a natural 20, 
So, good, good on you, Vax? The fight continues. At one point, Vax flies over to Keyleth and casts Heroism on her, which gives her some nice buffs, some HP, immunity to fear, that sort of thing. And he does so by kissing her, kind of neglecting the fact that they're all technically still seeming copies of Vax and Vax. So, I mean, he looks like he just made out with his sister. Uh, Syscon confirmed? Anyway, around the same time, Grog uses his new boots of feral leaping to Hulk jump up to the air and yes, tries to fight her a bit. She parries one of his blows, and he's kind of into it. Good lord, the fight keeps going, and Gurx is just saving against everything. Keyless Solar Beam, he saves against Zotaluke's Brazilian Sphere, he saves against the DCU-21. Good advantage, man. The first KO of the night is unfortunately Vexalia, after she takes a nice chunk of damage from Gurux and his ridiculous multi-attacks, and then she immediately takes a death saving throw because she was in the air at the time and she fell off her broom. Thankfully, Scanlan gets to her in time. So much damage is being distributed at this point, even Ashley's like, that's enough! While all this is going on, an illuminated guard comes out of nowhere in the middle of the battle, Vex tries to bribe him with a bag of jabs to try to help them fight. We don't know if it worked or not, but if they got the police force of the City of Brass on their asses, it's not gonna be pretty. Really cool tech by Grog. Gurix is far away from him, so he attaches the chain of returning to the Blood Axe, hucks at Gurix, and the axe is embedded into him. So Grog goes a little, uh, goes a little Indiana Jones and decides to swing down. Unfortunately, a failed acrobatics check later, he falls into the drink. The molten, superheated drink. He falls into a river of lava is what I'm saying. Oh, and also Matt discovered the real rules behind falling into lava, not the kind of sort of fake ones from the Underdark and the Plane of Fire last time. So as a result, Grog takes 63 points of fire damage. Thankfully, he's a sack of hit points! <laughs> oh god. Also, Travis, I, I, SummerSlam was a couple months ago. It might have been, might have done you better to do a Survivor Series joke. So, just, uh, just, uh, just a little heads up there, buddy. Later on in the fight, Percy, of course, misfires with Animus. Because that gun's fucking cursed. I don't know why he keeps using it. So, of course, he takes damage. And then he takes advantage of that mental damage to pretend like he's going crazy, like Gurix is doing something really, really fucked up to them mentally, which was done by him to try to throw off the Afrit. Second KO of the night goes to Pike, unfortunately, and she takes a fuck ton of damage from Gurix, who goes all multi-attack on her, at one point even poisoning her with his poison, which is kind of fucked up, as you'll see in a moment. Matt Mercer keeping us humble since 2013, says Liam O'Brien. Scanlan was able to help her avoid one of those blows, though, with an absolutely epic rendition of Baby One More Time by Britney Spears. As a result, Myth Carver starts vibrating more than it normally would after a cutting words. Anyway, after that happens, Scambo goes and tries to heal Pike for nothing. She doesn't heal. The Pit Fiend's poison. As long as the Pit Fiend's poison courses through her veins, she can't heal. Someone's gonna have to cure her of that poison first. Which is, of course, where Vex comes in. Vex has got protection from poison, so she's gonna definitely heal Pike. Except, she didn't actually see Pike get poisoned. Yes, Laura's very well aware that Pike is poisoned, but Vex in-game wouldn't be. Metagaming, bitches! Don't do it. She does the thing that Vex would do if she saw Pike down, she tries to heal. Now that she attempted to do so, she's well aware that Pike is poisoned. <laughs> Don't die, girl. Don't die, Pike. The first kill of the night goes to Keyleth, who kills the Arrhenius, known only as She-Ra. She's actually not known as She-Ra, that's just their nickname. They never ask for her name. They want to know what her name is, but they never ask. Well, Grog asked for like a second, and then she snarls at him, I think. I guess we'll never know what her name is. And her name wasn't even revealed on Tox Machina this week. Oh yeah, by the way, Tox Machina is still a thing. Poor Grog, though. He's still stuck in the lava, and he takes another fuck ton of damage because he's stuck in the lava. Thankfully, Stone's endurance keeps him alive. After he gets out of the lava, he grabs Pike, gets the hell out of Dodge, helps get her into the mansion, a 
and Vax is able to heal her with Lay on Hands to cure her of the poison. Percy then heals her with a potion. Then he goes out to save his girlfriend, who's getting owned by Gurix. Poor Vax. She almost falls to the same poison bullshit that Pike does. One of those attacks was very nearly stopped by Scanlan, who uses cutting words one more time with another one of those horrible, horrible limericks. Good God! Good God, that was offensive. Just the most offensive thing. Filthy, filthy Scanlan. Even the pit fiend was offended by that. And he's a, he's a denizen of the Nine Hells. It's like double hell or something, probably. And then Scanlan notices that his sword is still vibrating, and he's a little apprehensive to use it because he's not really a sword wielder. He's He's got a wit that can cut anyone down, but a sword? Not really something that he usually uses. After some encouragement by the rest of the party, and some heavy hinting by the dungeon master, Scanlan finally unleashes the power within Mythcarver. Myth Carver has awoken. Revealed later on on Tox Machina, turns out that what awoke Myth Carver was not something numeric, something that could be quantified. It was character development, and that seems to be what's going to power all the vestiges, or at least a good chunk of them. I'm still in the thought that maybe it was Vax's connection to the Raven Queen that awakened the Deathwalker's award, and with the strength of the Thousand Bards that wielded the blade before him, Scanlan attacks four times, all with advantage. Unfortunately, only three of them hit, but it's more than enough. How do you want to do this? Scanlan earns those coveted words and proceeds to slice off the wings and finally stab right through the heart, shouting in delight, that no one messes up a deal with Francois Australia. As Gurix dies, he fades, but he leaves a very ominous message behind. I will find you. Oh god, we're gonna have another fucking Hodus on our hands, aren't we? Oh man. Now we've got two denizens of the Nine Hells that are looking to settle the score with Fox Machina. I guess a trip to the Nine Hells is completely inevitable at this point. That'll come when it comes, but for now, Scanlan's time has come. And so is he. It's a sex joke! Thankfully, the battle is now over. But there is one tiny loose end. Remember that Efreet illuminated? Yeah, so it's still around, but Scanlan tries to convince it that Gurix was beginning a plot to murder the Sultan. Rolls pretty high in a persuasion check, so maybe he's into it. Meanwhile, Vex nearly dies, oh god, but it's okay. Kiki and Pike take care of her in the end, thankfully. Grog then does Scanlan a bit of a favor by telling him, as a slave, that he needs to get in there, into the mansion and help help out, and yeah, he, he ruins the deception. <laughs> and the Afrit's about to rat them out, but then Scanlan decides to... Once again, be the clutch gnome that he is, and modifies the memory of this Afridi Illuminated to make him think that Gurix was indeed going to murder the Sultan, and that he, the brave guard of the Sultan's honor, helped out these strangers who, who were uncovering this plot, and in an epic fight, defeated this Fiend and its Aranes partner, and this gnome was incredible. He destroyed this pit fiend. It fills him with a lot of joy and a great sense of self worth. And he should tell everyone. He should tell everyone about this. And of course, because it's Scanlan, it's successful. The Afridi's buddies don't believe him. They're just giving him shit, though. As a result, they go because they just showed up and they are pretty much going to bring the rest of the city's guard with them, which is a According to Matt, about 50,000 strong, or 15,000 strong, I don't know, either way, that would have been fucking horrible. Good thing Scanlan's broken as shit, please nerf, please nerf the gnome. With Gurix defeated, Percy grabs the manacle-shaped necklace that he wore as a token. The Aranus is looted, and awakened Myth Carver's item card is given to Scambo. And we finally head to break after three hours of fighting. 
After the break, a short rest happens. Heels, the items that were looted off the air nest are red, a rope of entanglement, and boots of spider climbing. And we finally get to talk to the Asimir kids, named Kyor and Hunin, who were around 16, unfortunately not all that educated. Respect, says Grog. Hail from a poorer part of Wild Mounts, and were apparently sold off by their evil hag of a mother. It's a lovely backstory. Vox Machina figures they should be taken to Whitestone to you know, help them get a new life. And Vax wants to celebrate the MVPs of the fight, Scanlan and Keyleth, who both got the kills. Keyleth, unfortunately, still on that whole self-loathing, doesn't want to be a hero trip. So they all drink some beer. And by all drink some beer, I mean Grog drinks most of it, and they get sips. Also, Vaxlan is teased. Apparently, it's not the first upside-down elfman kiss that Scanlan's ever had. The party just now realizes that they've been seeming as copies of Vax and Vex and a weird dwarf guy for the entire fight. So, Keyleth realizes that she was Vex when Vax kissed her. Apparently, Liam doesn't have that hang-up, but everyone else does. <laughs> oh god, sis confirmed. Vex, meanwhile, pecks Percy on the cheek for saving her. It's still a bit weird. The party then heads back to Jirael's place and they give her the good news about Gurix's death. A look of peace washes over her face and she upholds her end of the bargain. They are no longer her slaves and they can even walk away with the plate of the Dawn Martyr. Scanlan thinks maybe they should play one more hand for it. The rest of the party thankfully talks him down. Pike strips out of her old armor and puts on the plate of the Dawn Martyr, which is at first a little too big for her, but shrinks down to her size because it's magic armor. All the vestiges have been acquired. Awesome. Completionists everywhere are... Wait, what? what? Sorry. Wait, what did what did Matt say on Tox Machina? There might be more vestiges out there? Am I just destined to be wrong for the rest of my life? Pike then... Gets maybe a little too greedy when she asks about that uh, shield. The little uh, kind of a brassish shield that Jorael had right next to the plate of the Darn Martyr, you know, on the wall. Probably a bit too much to ask as she retracts herself a little bit after Jorael kind of talks her down a tiny bit. But finally, we get the details of the plate of the Dawn Martyr, and boy is it amazing. Well, plus three to AC, so already pretty good. The wearer is immune to being frightened and resistant to fire damage. Anytime an attacker hits you, the attacker takes 2d6 fire damage, and this is the craziest bit. Once per long rest, when you get knocked out, you immediately gain five hit points and come back to life, and enemies within 15 feet all have to make a dexterity saving throw or take 6d6 fire damage, with half of that being taken on a successful deck save. So yeah, that's a thing. <laughs> Go Pikey. It's a good thing we got all of Vox Machina a vestige, at least one vestige. Vax, with your double vestige power. After they leave, the party thinks about maybe just ditching Senegir, not going back and saying anything about the debt. Keyleth really, really wants to ditch Senegir. I don't know. Is she creeped out by him? Is she just in a rush to get back to Vort Daxio? Who knows? Ultimately, the party decides not to do that and just go and say goodbye to Senekir. Just check in. It's common courtesy, Keyleth. Senekir then decides to cash in the favor. He hands them a box that contained the ashes of his late wife, Zephine, who unfortunately died about four years ago. He just wants them to bury the ashes in Vasselheim under the birth heart because it was her hometown, it was where she was born and where she toiled. Come on guys, did you really think that it was going to be something sinister? Stop rolling inside checks! The party agrees, because they're ultimately good people. Percy then talks about possibly getting a commission done by Senekir later on, some sort of token with the five colors of the Karma Conclave instead within. Senekir thinks that maybe that's a good idea, and he'd be glad to do that piece of work later on. The party then decides to part ways with Senekir and Utan, and Keyleth plane shifts them back to the Prime Material Plane, back to Fort Daxio, where their worst fears are confirmed. Fire. Shouting. Winged beasts, presumably wyverns. Scorched earth. Turns out that maybe they shouldn't have left. Fort Daxio is falling. Oh boy! 
The end to another incredible saga. How awesome was that fight? And how clutch is Scanlan? Let me know in the comments below and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe if you like what you see. And you can follow me here on Twitter if you fancy. And you can follow this Twitter for episode updates. I've been Arthur from Natural 9, and is it Thursday yet?